Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the National Library of Scotland on this chilly but crisp St Andrew's Day. Whether you're here in the room with us or watching from across Scotland and beyond on our YouTube channel. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Claire Allen and I'm Head of Public Programmes here at the Library. I'm delighted to be introducing Stephen Vera Penn, who is here to talk about his new book, The Wisest Fool, The Lavish Life of James VI and I. But before I do so, I'm excited to be giving you an exclusive peek ahead to 2024, as I think it may be of particular interest to tonight's audience. Scotland's renaissance was colourful and cultured. Scotland was connected with Europe, not just through the court, but through many professions and relationships. We'll get a taster of that period this evening, and we're looking forward to sharing much more with you next summer in our special exhibition, Renaissance, Scotland and Europe, 1480 to 1630. James VI and I was one of the most significant British kings, the first monarch of the United Kingdom. The son of Mary, Queen of Scots, he united the kingdoms of Ireland, Scotland and England under one crown in 1603. He's long endured a mixed reputation, obscured by myth, anecdote and rumour. In, in Stephen's new biography, James's story is laid bare, casting fresh light on the personal, domestic, international and sexual politics of this misunderstood sovereign. Stephen Verapen was born in Glasgow to a Scottish mother and a Mauritian father. He graduated with first class honours from the University of Strathclyde and was awarded a PhD in 2014. He now teaches English to the new generation of students at Strathclyde. In addition to his academic work, he has also written a number of historical novels. Now, before handing over to Stephen, don't forget we'll have time at the end for you to ask some questions, so get thinking now. For those watching online, you can share them in the chat and we'll ask for you. But for now, please join me in giving a very warm library welcome to Stephen Verapen. Thank you, thank you everyone. And first of all, thank you again for coming out on such a cold, chilly, horrible uh, day today. Now, um, as Claire said, I'm going to be speaking about King James this evening and have a lot to say about King James. One of the difficulties I had when I was coming up with this talk is I was thinking, how do you condense an entire life into one hour? And the way... <laughs> is it me? Something's clicking. I'm just worried that the clicker it is working. <sighs> See, the first full room, and it was going to be modern technology there, so that's fine. No, it was me not clicking. It was, so that's okay. We're turns out I am the wisest fool. Um, what I landed on in terms of trying to convey as much as possible is. 10 moments that made James the sixth and first. Now, for those of you that know something about King James, if I have neglected to choose your favourite moment in his life, please uh, keep your comments at the end and then you can um, berate me afterwards and I'll uh, welcome that. So I'm going to run through 10 moments in chronological order that I think are the most significant moments in James's life. Not all positive moments, I should say. Some of them, in fact, arguably quite troublesome moments. And there is one further caveat, which is, yes, I'm saying 10 moments, but I'm also going to cheat and talk a bit more than 10 as we go through. So the first thing that we really need to know about King James is how early it was that he became king. He was only a child. So my moment number one is his coronation, which was the 29th of July, 1567. The image that we have on the screen there is Stirling Castle. Um, I'm assuming people are familiar with Stirling Castle. This is a mock-up, really, or an artistic recreation of how it would have looked in the period. What you might notice is that the drum towers at the entrance are actually significantly higher in the past than they, uh, than they are now. But James was crowned, like most children, King of Scots when he was a baby, I'm just, sorry, I'm really sorry. I'm not, I'm not trying to steal the show, <laughs> honestly. Your mic is just clicking and it's just causing a little I bit. think it's this. Yeah. So if we can just swap you to the Yes. Button. That one also has a thing on it. Yeah. Is that? Yeah. So 
everyone okay? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, people. Is it? Is the clicking? I can hold it like this. If I just sit, sit like this, I know I'm fine to do that. Um, if I start hearing it again and noticing it, I'll, I'll try and take care of it. So yes, James's baptism, coronation, his his youth. He was an infant when he became king. This was not unusual, really, in the annals of 16th century Scottish history. Partly because so many kings kept dying young, James the Fourth, uh, James the Fifth, when he was uh, thirty, led to a lot of royal minorities. So there was a, a kind of tradition in Scotland in the sixteenth century of new monarchs becoming monarchs before they even know that they have feet. And in James's case, there was something unusual in that his mother was very much still alive. His mother had been deposed, and not quite obviously happily from her perspective. Following his baptism, there was a problem with Mary Queen of Scots, I think. The problem was that throughout her personal rule in Scotland, she had played a game of tolerance, really. She had tried to limit her Catholicism to herself. She would hear mass privately in the Chapel Royal at Holyrood House, and she didn't do anything really materially to frighten the Protestant elite. She was trying to say, yes, I am a Catholic, but I will keep it to myself. I'm not going to change the established Protestant religion, which had taken place while she was in France. But when she had James, and when she was going to have him baptised, she really had to kind of reveal her hand, as it were, because she had two options. She could baptise him as a Catholic, and maintain her European credentials. She was a Catholic. She believed in uh, European Catholicism as much as she tried to hide it. Or she could have him baptised as a Protestant, which would please the Protestant elite in Scotland, but uh, would be going against her, her genuine beliefs. So she decided to have him baptised Catholic. And I think it's no coincidence that Mary's downfall came within months of that Catholic baptism, within months Darnley had been blown up under mysterious circumstances. Mary had been accused of complicity in that murder, and she was gone. She was uh, locked up, she was deposed, and James, the infant, was uh, crowned King of Scots. The image, I don't know if it's very visible there, but the image in the background is the uh, Holyrood Church at Stirling where James was crowned King. And he would stay at Stirling throughout his childhood. He would be educated at Stirling under George Buchanan. Uh, I'm assuming people might have heard of George Buchanan. Extremely eminent scholar, European credentials as a scholar, but also a deeply weird man. Um, <laughs> extremely misogynistic. He hated women. He never married. He had an almost prurient interest in people's sex lives, despite himself being a bachelor. He was highly intelligent, as I said, but he also, by the time he came to teach James, was extremely Calvinist, was extremely anti-Mary Queen of Scots. James's upbringing as separate from his mother, because by this time she had been deposed and then she fled to England, as we know, and was kept in captivity, it wasn't so unusual for a royal child to be brought up separately from their parents. This was par for the course in the 16th century. Children would be given their own households. What was unusual about James's upbringing is that under Buchanan, he was explicitly taught, you should hate your mother. She is a monster. She is a Catholic whore. All of this really vile stuff that he was uh, taught and told and was really sort of drummed into him. And this is significant, I think, because Buchanan ultimately failed. Rather than teaching James to hate and fear his family, um, he called James at one point a true bird of that bloody nest, essentially saying, you and your family are all horrific monsters and clowns and fools and you have no right to rule. James came to the opposite conclusion. I suppose if you teach a child or, or try and beat lessons into a child, there's always the risk that they will not respond well to those lessons and will actually come to the opposite conclusion. James, in fact, came to be fascinated with his family. I would argue almost obsessed with the idea of family. And we will see that as we go on. 
family and the concept of family started bleeding into his political rhetoric. It started bleeding into the nicknames and things that he gave his various lovers over the years. He was really obsessed with family. So it's fitting, I think, that number two on our list here is a family member of James's. Esme Stewart, who was a cousin on James's father's side. So Darnley's father, Lennox, his brother's son was Esme Stewart, a very cultured Frenchman who was brought up in France with that branch of the Lennox Stewarts um, held sway. But before we get into Esme Stewart, who arrived in Scotland at James's invitation in 1579, I want to go a bit further back in time. The image on the left here is um, Elizabeth I, the young Lady Elizabeth as she was. She was robbed of her princess title by Henry VIII. And on the right is Lord Admiral Seymour. Now, if anyone ever saw the old movie Young Bess, has anyone come across this? I could be wrong. I think it had Charles Lawton as Henry VIII in it, one of his several turns as Henry VIII. It presents a very romanticised image. For centuries almost, the relationship between these two people has been played as kind of a romance. He was an older man in his 30s. She was 14, 15, in fact, certainly 13. He made advances towards her when she was extremely young. Recently, scholarship has kind of acknowledged that for what it is, which is intensely creepy and unpleasant. <laughs> and he is essentially known to people now as something of a predator. He wasn't really interested, well, I hope he wasn't really interested in this young girl. He was interested in her family and her political value. He made advances towards her. There's stories that come out of him cutting up her dresses, well, she's in them, I should point out, cutting up her dresses, um, sneaking into her bedchamber and trying to tickle her under the covers and things like this. At the time, this caused a bit of a scandal. There were even rumours, first of many rumours, of Elizabeth being pregnant to this, this man. He was married, I should say, to Catherine Parr, who was Henry VIII's widow, so that made the whole thing even just more sordid, if, if it needed to be more sordid. But at the time, Elizabeth was accused as well of complicity in this. The idea floating around under her brother Edward, who was king, was that, well, she must have been involved in this. She must have encouraged it. She must have liked it in some way. When what we can appreciate now is she was a child. She was extremely young. Seymour encouraged her to, to feel more mature than, than she actually was and all this sort of stuff. The typical um, thing that um, what we'd now call grooming does. Keep that in mind because if we go back to Esme Stewart, he arrived in Scotland, as I said, in 1579. He was in his 30s, like uh, Seymour, and James was 12, then 13, he was a, a young man as well. And a very similar thing played out. Now, in a lot of biographies, this is played again as a bit of a romance. James developed this crush on his handsome, French-educated, cultured cousin, and it was all very pleasant. Well, not really, because he was in his 30s, sorry to reiterate this, and James was a child. What happened was that Esme arrived full of ambition, as many men did, many politicians did, still do, probably, uh, in the world. And he recognised that James had an attraction towards men. James, throughout his life, would prove to be almost aggressively bisexual. He uh, formed very deep <laughs> relationships with people. Sexually, he appears to have been interested in men and women. Romantically, he had a much stronger attraction towards men. Esme seemed to recognise and encourage that. And this obviously led to hills of protest from the Scottish Kirk. And you start to find reports of the vices that the king is being involved in, is being dragged into. James reportedly started swearing as well. And there's a wonderful quote, it's what is it they refer to as the French fruits, supposedly. It was the French fruits that James was being enticed to eat when he was um, in love or he fancied himself in love with this man. But there were political ramifications to it as well. James 
really loved Esme Stroud. I liked to think he never realised that Esme was just using him for political value, for political clout. But Esme's goal was really to climb as high as he could in the Scottish political scene, and he made a damn good effort at it, and to get rid of anyone that was in his way. And this man who, I should say, is horrible in his own right, that's one of the problems with 16th century Scottish politicians, they were all horrible. But this was the Earl of Morton, who was the last of King James's regents. James was still, as I keep pointing out, very young, a child really. So he had these regents who ruled in his name. Morton was the last of them, and Esme was determined to get rid of him. So him and his pal, uh, Captain Stuart, Captain James Stuart, who James elevated to the earldom of Arran, got together, ousted Morton by accusing him of complicity in Darnley's murder back in the day, which, to be fair, he was part of, and he ended up losing his head. But the problem with Esme and the problem with factionalism in general in this period is that as soon as you got popular, as soon as you were with the king, as soon as you achieved a level of power from the king, there were people that wanted rid of you too. It happened to Morton. People wanted rid of him. They got rid of him. Now it was going to happen to Esme as well. People did not like seeing their king hanging around the neck of this 30-something um, Frenchman, giving him honours, giving him jewels, giving him power, and they decided to get rid of him. This they did in 1582, and this is our third key event. The Riven Raid, or Ruthven Raid, usually pronounced Riven so that James can um, later write a poem punning on Raven. But what this involved was James being kidnapped, and this was just one of many attempted kidnapping attempts. It just so happens that this one was successful. Lord Riven and his cronies decided to separate James from Esme. They kidnapped him, they locked him up, and they forced him to banish his older lover. James cried, and he stomped his feet, and he refused to write this uh, banishment letter, but eventually he gave in, and he did so. Esme left, and James wrote a poem called, it's a very tortured title, a metaphorical invention of the phoenix, in which he compared Esme to a beautiful phoenix that has flown uh, to Scotland and has then been burned, but it will be reborn. Esme left for France. He was forced. He didn't have a choice. He dallied around for a while, trying to remain in Scotland as long as possible, hoping the tide would turn, but it didn't, and he went to France, where he promptly pleased a lot of Scottish politicians by dying. Just dying. Uh, and it, for once... It wasn't poison and it wasn't a dagger. He just died. Now, I should point out here, Elizabeth I was delighted about this. Why was she delighted? Because she was an extremely... I love Elizabeth I, I should point out, but she was an extremely meddlesome woman when it came to Scotland. She wanted to stick her oar in constantly and she often did it quite successfully. She had not liked Esme Stewart any more than Lord Riven or his cronies because she saw that as... Scotland essentially falling under French influence. She wanted Scotland under English influence. She was extremely happy. This was going to make her more happy. This is number four, the Treaty of Berwick of 1586. Now I've subtitled it here, Amity, Annuity and Execution. James and Elizabeth had I think one of the most interesting relationships that I've come across. More interesting than James's relationship with his mother, actually. Because when you read their letters, when you see what they were saying to each other, you get this wonderful sense of, my God, these two people hated one another, but they could never admit they hated one another. And so instead they went the other way occasionally, wrapping their uh, points up in this effusive language, pretending that they loved one another. And you can almost sense the seething resentment underneath the words. There's one letter that I always remember that Elizabeth had written to James. She used to write really scolding, sort of nasty letters when, it, when she felt like it, when she was in the mood, or when James had done something she didn't approve of, uh, like having a French friend or writing to the French or in any way seeming pro-French. 
She wrote him one particularly acerbic letter and James replied to it saying, I take not unkindly to your passionate letter for I perceive sparkles of love within the midst of the strongest <laughs> clouds of passion. I, I said, yes, James, because I, it was one of the few times he got one up on her where she looked like the fool in that. Now, what happened in 1586 was this long, tortuous dance between James and Elizabeth continued. She wanted him to listen to her, to essentially do as she said. What she wanted was in a way to kind of buy Scotland cheaply, because she was tight, uh, but to buy Scotland and kind of keep James in her pocket. This came to be, in a sense, in 1586, because even by this period, and we will mention this again, James loved spending money that he didn't have. He loved living lavishly. He loved living beyond his means. He would never learn not to do this. So t until he died, he was just in spiralling debts. But the Treaty of 1586 was a treaty of amity between England and between Scotland. And it was sweetened, from James's perspective, with a pension from Elizabeth. He always called it his annuity. She always called it a pension. And the actual price that it was, he was determined to get £5,000 per year out of her for the price of his friendship. She was determined not to give £5,000 a year. And it kind of averaged out, I believe, about between £3,000 and £4,000, but she used to give him a little bit more when he was a good boy and a little bit less if she thought he was starting to misbehave. So this all seems lovely, doesn't it? Friendship between England and Scotland. Of course, it's going to last forever. But it set the stage for something else. Because Mary, Queen of Scots, was still alive, obviously, in 1586. But not everyone wanted her alive. If we think particularly of Elizabeth's ministers and the English Parliament, what did they want? They wanted Mary Queen of Scots dead. And they didn't just want her dead, they wanted her publicly and bloodily executed for the awful, awful Catholic that she was. They wanted her executed as an example. This is uh, Catholic perfidy. We've kept her in England and she's been a notorious evil plotter, all of that sort of stuff. From Elizabeth's ministers, particularly Walsingham, I think, and uh, Cecil Lord Burley, the stage was now set. They had bought off James. They had bought Scotland's friendship. Now they had cleared the decks and they were free to execute Mary Queen of Scots. All they needed was a reason to execute her. And so this is when we come to the Babington plot that went on. I'm sure people are familiar with this. It's been filmed so many times and things. Mary was essentially given a, a kind of channel of communication to the outside world after a period of increasingly harsh captivity. And what they did then was wait. They waited until something could be used to incriminate her. There was talk of forgery in what they eventually found. Mary always denied that she had been actively involved in plotting against Elizabeth. What she did was sanction Anthony Babington and his friends to launch an enterprise the nature of that enterprise was obviously to assassinate Elizabeth and replace her with Mary, but Mary was very careful never to actually say that. She wanted to turn a blind eye to that. It didn't matter. Walsingham and Cecil just needed proof that there was a plot against Elizabeth and that Mary had known about it, and then they were able to try her, to condemn her to uh, execution on the block. But there was still a bit of an unknown. How would James react to that? He hadn't seen his mother since he was a baby. He had no relationship with her beyond letters, which had actually started under Esme Stewart. He'd encouraged communication between uh, mother and son. No one really knew how James would react. You may have come across biographies and things or discussion claiming that James was extremely cold. He did nothing. He didn't lift a finger to save his mother's life. I'm a little bit fairer to James on this because what seems to have been the, the case really is that he did not believe Elizabeth would actually do it. He did not think right up until the end that Elizabeth would kill a, an anointed monarch. He thought she would back down. He thought she would um, 
find some other way. He suggested other ways. He wrote letters saying, maybe you could lock her up a little bit tighter. Uh, maybe you could send her somewhere with that sort of get written guarantees that she won't try and kill you again. Um, all kinds of things. And the wild card was he empowered his ambassadors to offer Elizabeth his hand in marriage, um, which she did not accept. Instead, she executed his mother. <laughs> there was, I suppose, if, if you look at things coldly, a bit of a plus point to Mary, Queen of Scots, being out of the picture. And that is number five, James's marriage. Now, throughout Mary's life, right up until she was executed, she was adamant that she was Queen of Scots. Her deposition had been forced. Her abdication had been signed under duress. So James was always in a bit of a funny position. He'd been crowned King of Scots in a very sparsely attended ceremony at, at Stirling, but his mother was still alive and still claiming to be the ruler of Scotland. Imprisoned, yes, but the ruler of Scotland. When she was gone, James for the first time was sole king. No one else was claiming his throne, claiming his crown. That made him more attractive to uh, the, the ladies of Europe, the prospective brides of Europe. And it's no coincidence, I don't think, that immediately after Mary's death, we start to see serious marriage negotiations. There were um, two options. There was Catherine of Navarre, and there was actually Elizabeth of Denmark. That's Anna of Denmark, but Elizabeth of Denmark, her older sister. James commissioned reports on both women. The report on poor Catherine, who was in her early 30s, came back that Catherine of Navarre is um, old, cracked and something worse if all were known um and sadly history has not recorded what that something worse could possibly be i'm so curious uh, james was really more drawn to the danish match and it ultimately didn't matter because the people of edinburgh were also more drawn to the danish match so they were pushing him in that direction scotland had a lot of links with denmark um, maritime links trading links all of this sort of stuff so the danish match was uh, the likeliest one. James eventually agreed, but sadly by the time he did agree, Elizabeth of Denmark had been pledged elsewhere. The negotiations for the marriage really dragged out because Frederick II of Denmark, Norway, really wanted the Orkney and Shetland Islands back. <laughs> like, that was his sticking point. You can marry any one of my uh, family members if you give me those islands back. And James was determined not to give the islands back, which he obviously stuck to. Um, thankfully, like Esme, Frederick did everyone a favour by dying and his wife, uh, the Dowager Queen Sophie, was quite happy. Yeah, she didn't care about the Orkney and Shetland Islands. said, you can have my daughter. Uh, but by this time, it was Anna of Denmark. James sailed across the North Sea, which was strangely stormy. Um, that winter, yes, yeah, see, I can hear laugh, uh, nods and laughter already. Um, because what did it lead to? James had a wonderful time going to meet his bride. He cleared his bedchamber out of young men, interestingly. Um, he had an idea that this young woman, she was only uh, 15, she was going to provide for his sexual needs, she was going to provide for his romantic needs, all of this sort of stuff. And everything seemed good in Denmark and Norway, except for the fact that people started to ask questions about what had caused those storms, because they didn't seem natural. In Denmark, the blame was given to witches. James, once he got back to Scotland with his new bride, started to think that maybe these Danish witches had not acted alone. They must have had Scottish contacts. And this is where we start to see the outbreaks of witch trials. Now, I'm not going to try and defend James even slightly on this because um, he was a monster when it came to witches. What I would point out, though, uh, and this is kind of difficult from the perspective of 2023, because we know that there are no such things as witches. We know that these women, and they were mostly women, there were some men, but 85% over the course of these uh, witch trials would be women. In context, though, what were a lot of early modern monarchs doing in the 16th century? They were starting wars. We see this all over Europe. They were beginning wars and they were really causing hundreds of thousands of deaths. James was a peace-loving king. 
but I would argue that his view of witches was akin to war. He was declaring war on Satan and Satan's minions. Um, he was wrong, it was insane, but he believed it. He believed that there were covens, that there were groups of witches having mass meetings in North Berwick uh, and later right across Scotland, and he was at war with them. There was, I suppose, from a cynical point of view, a plus point to this. James, throughout his life in Scotland, was in a, a bit of a battle with the Kirk. He wanted to be seen as supreme head of the Kirk. They wanted a Presbyterian system by which the king was not supreme head. What is a good way of making yourself look like you are indispensable to an institution? Well, finding out who its biggest enemy is and presenting yourself as uh, the antidote to that enemy. Satan was the enemy of the Kirk and James was the enemy of Satan, was his view. So, like I said, it's not a justification of these horrific witchcraft trials or anything, but I think it should be looked at in the in the same context as the wars, the, the actual physical European wars that were being fought at the time. James's marriage to Anna has actually received amazingly little attention and it tends to be written off. It tends to be stated that, oh, Anna was a crypto-Catholic and this was a huge embarrassment to James. The only problem there is that there's no absolute proof she certainly was sympathetic to Catholics. There's no proof it embarrassed James. In fact, quite the opposite. James and Anna seem to have worked together in looking soft on Catholicism and looking friendly, obviously, towards Protestantism. What were they up to? I would argue that they were both looking ahead towards succeeding Elizabeth in England. They didn't want Catholic resistance to their claims. They didn't want English Catholics standing against them, so it stood them both in good stead if they looked as if they were friendly to the Catholics, and Anna certainly was friendly to the Catholics. Whether or not she actually converted and became one, I have my doubts, and I'll, I'll tell you why, because in the early 17th century, the Pope had his doubts as well. The Pope sent multiple agents over to find out what this Queen of England actually was. She was Queen of England by this time, and uh, he couldn't. And I think, well, if the Pope didn't know, then what chance do we have today? But it does suggest that these multiple Jesuit priests who claimed she had converted were probably either deceived or they were lying. Uh, first of all, how many times do you need to convert to become a Catholic? I mean, doesn't one do the job? Clearly not, because multiple priests were claiming it. So there were some dodgy things going on. My belief is that Anna stayed Lutheran, but with strongly Catholic sympathies, and it was probably a political move. The other thing that held them together, I think, was this six, very 16th century belief in honour, the honour system. Anna had married into the Stuart. She was a Stuart queen now. James's honour really relied on his English succession rights being recognised. She was part of that too now. It was every bit her sense of honour that relied on it too. What we also read sometimes is that Anna was stupid. Uh, some, write, some historians have actually just said, in fact, they, I, I don't know if anyone ever read the 1950s biography of King James, uh, David Harris Wilson, and it sums up Anna in one line. Alas, the king had married a stupid wife. That's how you could get away with that in the 1950s, apparently. Um, Anna was not stupid. Um, we know this from practical things. She could speak multiple languages very quickly. She had a real interest in the arts. She would use artistic patronage to build networks, build relationships. She wasn't a stupid woman. It's sometimes claimed as well that James was very disappointed, you know, very disappointed in this wife. He was an intellectual man. He'd been uh, taught under George Buchanan. He had these high-flown tastes in um, rhetoric and logic, and this ignorant woman just, you know, couldn't meet up to that, couldn't match his intellect. There are two problems with that. One of them, and I think the big one, is that, well, when we see James fall in love, which we will in a little while, uh, it was with an idiot. So he clearly had no problems um, 
mating and matching with people that weren't particularly bright. And the second thing is really just a, a, a historical point. Are there any 16th century kings that wanted a wife who was able to match them in debate and in sort of debating skill and in level of education? I don't think so. I mean, look at Henry VIII and Catherine Parr when she tried to dispute with him. He supposedly had her death warrant drawn up and she had to talk her way out of it by saying she'd only engaged in educational talk to distract him from his sore leg. So no, uh, no 16th century king wanted a wife that was going to sort of debate religion and, and <laughs> theology and things with them. So Anna and James were extremely happy. They had their son, Prince Henry, who, um, it's a very cute picture, but um, the birth of Prince Henry didn't make the top 10, I'm afraid, um, and Henry didn't make the age of 20. That's why he didn't make the top 10. James's goal in Scotland was really to strengthen the Scottish crown and to gain mastery over the Kirk. That's what he wanted. And he did all of this, I have to say, fairly well during his time. He raised the prestige of the Scottish crown. Anna had a huge role in that, I should say. She, was, she almost functioned both in Scotland and England as the kind of PR wing of the monarchy. She was uh, giving it the, the glister and the prestige and all of that with her Danish connections. In terms of the Kirk, there had been Presbyterian riots, there had been um, attempts to overthrow James and his ministers, similar to what you see in England. In England, you've probably seen dramatised or read about the Earl of Essex, the dashing Earl of Essex, wonderful leader. Everyone loved the Earl of Essex until he tried to raise a coup to get rid of Elizabeth's ministers. Then everyone locked their doors when he rode through London trying to drum up a mob. No one answered. A similar thing happened to James in Edinburgh. A mob rose, but James managed to cut it off before it could find a leader. And because of that, the cause of Presbyterianism was kind of um, defanged for a while. James was riding high by the late 1590s. And then something very strange happened in 1600, and this was the Gowrie conspiracy. James claimed that he had been out hunting in Perth. He loved hunting. When he met Alexander Riven, so the name Riven again, and what Riven claimed was that he'd met a man who'd found a pot of gold. Is it, you can, I'm almost laughing to this ridiculous story. Um, and James had accompanied him to find out the truth of this. He'd gone back to Gowrie House. There he'd found uh, Alexander Riven had taken him there. The Earl of Gowrie was there as well. It was his house. And James had been given a, a strange dinner that was seemingly thrown together and then led up into a tower where every door was locked behind him and he thought nothing of this normal. Then he got into this tower and found a stranger, a man he'd never seen before. Then uh, Riven locked the door and threatened to stab him in retribution for um, his father. This was the previous Riven who'd kidnapped James many years before um, for him being executed for that. James screamed for help at a window, shouted treason, treason, and his hunting party who had followed him to Gowrie House broke down the doors, found secret entrances, they all burst in and they killed Alexander Riven and they killed the Earl of Gowrie. And James thought this was great. James thought, I was nearly murdered, but look, God smiled down and saved me. And he tried to make this a national holiday. So remember, remember the 5th of August? There's a reason we don't. Um, because hardly anyone believed this. Queen Anna didn't believe it. She thought, what? This story, there are plot holes here. This does not quite cohere as a story. What did happen? This is... <laughs> We are all speculating at this stage, and there have been multiple attempts by people to try and work out what happened. Some of them are fantastical. So there is one that um, James had tried to solicit sex from Alexander Riven, who was a courtier. James had known him already, and he was reputed to be very handsome, uh, and been rebuffed, and then decided to have his hunting party kill him and his brother to, to hush this up. It's unlikely. James was never a sexual predator or anything like that. The other thing that people have leapt on is, well, the Gowries had owed money to the Crown. Uh, sorry, the other way around, the Crown had owed money to the Gowries. 
Uh, so James was in debt to them. Did he possibly stage manage this whole thing to have them killed so that he could get out of paying the debt? Again, I don't think it's likely. Uh, James was, not only was he not a sexual predator, he also wasn't this kind of sinister mafia don that was arranging um, state murders. So I'm aware of the clicking, I'm trying to keep hold of this. What I think happened, what probably happened, is that James, James's strange story was partly true. Riven had asked him to go to Gowrie House, possibly under some sort of pretext, and I think it was probably to do with the ongoing Anglo-Spanish discussion, uh, sorry, Anglo-Spanish, Anglo-Scottish discussion that was going on. There was a lot of traffic north and south of the border, really on the subject of Elizabeth I's death, and who was going to succeed her, who was going to accept it, all of this sort of stuff. I think the Gowries wanted in on this, they wanted some official role. They got James to the house, there was some sort of disagreement, we'll never know what really went down, we'll never know what the disagreement was, but I think one of them possibly said something threatening to James to try and get him, not to actually threaten to kill him, but to try and get James the King to invite them into this cross-border discussion. James panicked. I mean, you would if you're locked in a tower. Um, called for help and things got out of hand and it just left two people dead. James, though, really, I think, did believe, always would believe that they had meant to kill him. He was wrong, I think, but he did believe it. And happily for James, although there were lots of questions about this, did this really happen? Is this, did it happen the way you say it happened? Um, he was able to ride it out and it didn't seriously affect our next point. Number seven, where are we for time? Still good, uh, good for time. Number seven was James's succession. I've selected this, this is the next most important moment. In 1603, Elizabeth I, you can see death peering over her shoulder there, coming for her. Um, the only thing I have to say about Elizabeth I's death is that despite what you might read on the Greenwich Palace website, she did not die with an inch of makeup on her face. Um, that's what the website actually claims. It claims that she died with an inch of makeup on her face. Nonsense. Um, and it's something we've seen Hollywood repeat over and over again. If you think of Elizabeth R and Glenda Jackson when she's painted up in white lead makeup, kind of freak at her own court because no one else is painted like this. Um, the source of the white makeup myth, I have only traced as far as one contemporary source, which was a Jesuit priest, Father Rivers, who claimed that he knew someone who knew someone who had been at court at the Christmas revels in 1601, and the Queen had half a, not even an inch, but half an inch of makeup all over her. And he admitted in the, the account that it was third-hand information. That's the only source. Everyone that actually saw Elizabeth in her dotage, they commented on her thin lips and her missing teeth and her red wings, never mentioned makeup. So, um, she died in 1603 without an inch of makeup on her face. James had been foreseeing this for, for years. Foreseeing is, I suppose, a nice way of putting it. He'd been desperate for this for years. He'd just been waiting. He'd been in contact with the image on the left there is Elizabeth's great secretary, Cecil. This is the son of William Cecil, Lord Burley, who had been so instrumental in getting rid of Mary, Queen of Scots. James had organised his succession, essentially. Cecil was his man at the English court, with a couple of others, and everything went incredibly smoothly. James was proclaimed king of, uh, not just of Scotland now, but of England, Ireland, and they still had that weird claim to France that they loved to throw in the English kings. He was delighted. He was happy. He promised peace was his big mission. He wanted to end Elizabeth's long, expensive Anglo-Spanish war. That was his first order of business. He wanted unity. He wanted to unite England and Scotland, not just in his person, as he put it, but politically. He wanted some sort of, he wanted a, an extremely comprehensive political union. So you sometimes see in biographies of James that as if he was forward thinking, he had this idea of political unification of England and Scotland that would not come true until 1707. Um, actually, James's view of union was more comprehensive than what happened in 1707. As you know then, and still today, Scotland retained 
its own church and retained its own legal system, still does. James wasn't really big on that. He wanted the English church to be spread north. He wanted the English common law to be spread north, which, which never happened. But he wanted to spread unity, peace, all of these things. And he thought it would be smooth. He thought that it would all happen um, fairly quickly. On that, he was wrong. He was also soon going to pay for what he and Queen Anna had been up to for years, which was exciting and encouraging Catholic hopes. When they became King and Queen of England, there had been some worry that what if the Catholics don't accept them? And then we find the Pope uh, sending over a, a nuncio to say that the Holy Father would not stand in their way, would not recognise anyone else's claims to the English throne. This was music to James and Anna's ears. It really proved the, the rightness of what they'd been doing for uh, for years and years, you know, for a decade. Um, no one was standing up to them. The Catholics accepted them, the Protestants accepted them. But as I said, James was keen on promoting continuity with Elizabeth. He actually said that he was more fortunate than the predecessors on the English throne because when each one of them, going back to um, Henry VIII, had become king or queen, they'd found they'd had to make some changes in the church. They'd had to, whether it's a complete uh, reformation or a counter-reformation or a counter-counter-reformation, they'd had to make changes. He was fortunate. He'd found the English church perfect. Now, if you were a Catholic who has been led on for years that you're going to be granted more tolerance under this coming king, that he's actually, him and his wife are friendly towards you, and then you find out, no, they're actually not. They're going, they might suspend fines for a few months, but they're so desperate for money, they're going to restart them, and you're going to suffer just as you did before. You're not going to be happy. And Robert Catesby certainly was not happy. And that is why he really led and organised the gunpowder plot. It's one of those historical things that people often get quite annoyed that it's, everyone knows Guy Fawkes and no one or hardly anyone knows Robert Catesby. Catesby was the mastermind. Guy Fawkes was really just the munitions guy, the one that was found on the scene uh, in the undercroft at Westminster tending his 36 barrels of gunpowder. Their plan, as we know, was to blow up the Houses of Parliament, to blow up King James, probably to blow up Anna if she'd happened to be there, but certainly to blow up uh, Prince Henry as well. They were going to use James's daughter, uh, Princess Elizabeth, as a puppet queen. So the plan was to blow up half of London, I think. They've done tests on TV to say, would it have worked? Would the gun that much gunpowder have worked? And yes, not only would it have worked, it would take have taken out a, a good part of London with it. Then they were going to ride to the Midlands, kidnap uh, Princess Elizabeth, and set up a puppet government on her name. They don't seem to have thought or cared that James was also King of Scots and there was a Scottish Parliament and you know, the Scots might have something to say about their king going to London and being blown up. Uh, they also don't seem to have taken much notice of little Prince Charles, who had become Charles I. He was uh, very young at the time. Uh, they, they didn't seem to reckon into their plans uh, very much. The gunpowder plotters were not the most intelligent people in the world. I don't, when you read it, I mean, the measure of it, I think, is when Guy Fawkes was caught in that undercroft with his lantern, his legendary lantern and all that gunpowder, and he was asked his name, all he could give was John Johnson. And I thought, my God, you've had months and months to come up with a pseudonym and that's the best you could do. Um, so the gunpowder plot failed. James got what he had wanted with the Gowrie conspiracy, which was a lasting memorial to God loving him and saving him. So remember, remember the 5th of November, we all do. Um, remember, the, remember the 5th of August, not so much. Number nine is James is falling in love, which uh, would be a nice thing if he'd fallen in love with someone that wasn't quite as stupid. Um, but the object of his desire was Robert Carr. Um, I'll keep referring to him as Robert Carr, James couldn't elevate him um, fast enough. He became the Earl of Somerset eventually. Robert Carr was, uh, we have him on the image on the left here, supposedly uh, smooth of face and straight of limb. And just looking at this image, I think high of forehead as well. Um, James had known him in his youth 
and then met him again in 1607 when at the tilts for accession day from celebrations of James's um, accession a horse fell and landed on car and broke one of his straight limbs or some say some sources say an arm some say a leg James fell head over heels in love with this younger man what had happened was that when he came to England his um, interest in men had manifested itself again interestingly whilst he was married to Anna in Scotland there don't seem to have been reports of, of relationships with young men. There were prior to his marriage, there was Esme Stewart, obviously, but then a succession of, of handsome young minions. Then that stops when he's married to Anna. Now, James wasn't, certainly not living like a monk, because Anna was having a lot of children. So when they got to England, James seems to have started noticing all these extremely elegantly clad men um, and his, I suppose, his homosexual urges started to, to manifest again. But it was never very serious. So there's a succession of these unimportant young men and then comes this guy. And it was noticeable immediately because the reports suddenly were the king's visiting him while he recovers from his broken leg or broken arm. The king's visiting him every day. The king's kissing him publicly. The king is teaching him Latin. <laughs> Language of romance. Um, <laughs> James was smitten. And one of the interesting things, well, two interesting things, one of them was Anna's pregnancy stop. She had two pregnancies and two births in England in their early years. Both uh, children sadly died in infancy, but once she has um, almost given way to Carr, the pregnancies stop. James starts spending all his time with this guy. The second interesting thing is James did not mind his young men marrying. In fact, he would often arrange marriages for them. He knew fine well that um, these male-male relationships were, uh, they weren't going to result in marriage between the two men or anything like that in, the, in this period. The men still had to marry and um, beget a dynasty and all of that sort of stuff. The problem with um, Carr was that he wanted to marry this woman, Frances Howard, the Countess of Essex, and there's a clue in the name. She was already married to the Earl of Essex. This was the son of um, Elizabeth's Essex. James didn't care. He organised the divorce. When there was resistance to it, he packed the commission so that a divorce would be granted. One other guy stood up to it, and this was Carr's friend and mentor, Thomas Overbury, who's the image on the left. Now, Carr, I said, yes, he was straight of limb, smooth of face. He was low on intellect, but he was intelligent enough to know that he wasn't very intelligent and that he needed someone to be his his mentor his uh secretary was it was the title he had over but he didn't want Carr to marry francis um he tried to stop it james got annoyed at this james had promised his lover that he would find him a wife and that it was he was going to get the wife he wanted so he had Carr locked up in the tower their car died. We seem to be going through a lot of people who conveniently die. This time it was murder, though. This time it was absolutely murder. And the guilty party was Frances Howard, who was now Countess of Somerset because she'd married Carr, Earl of Somerset. She had objected to Thomas Overbury getting in the way of her marrying the king's favourite. And so it seems that she hired just about every poisoner in London to smuggle things into the tower to kill Overbury and shut him up. Um, he left behind supposedly a gruesome, stinking corpse, um, which was, is not particularly pleasant. This all came out, though. It all came out in a very dodgy way. Oops, I've gone a bit too far. Um, when supposed uh, rumours out of Europe arrived, people claiming that they were part of this murder plot, this all threatened to be a, a real scandal. It was going to be a scandal because the king's lover and great favourite was now being accused of murder, and so was his wife. James really wanted to get out of this, I call it a relationship. And in this way, it wasn't a, a huge um, wrench for him because one of the problems with Carr is that since James had arranged the marriage with Francis, Carr had committed a bit of a sin 
and the sin was that he dared to actually love his murderous wife. I mean, he, you, I said there was a real passion in that marriage. James didn't like that. He didn't object to his lovers marrying. As I say, he set up the marriages. He did object to them actually caring about their wives and spending time with their wives. And there's a letter from James complaining to Carr about your long withdrawing and creeping back from lying in my chamber. So James was actually fairly happy to see Carr go. It was a, it was a passionate romance, but it didn't last because... Um, the lover was, once again, a bit of an idea. <laughs> what happened next involved Anna, and that was the substitution of this guy, um, George Villiers, who was James's next and possibly greatest love interest or lover. Anna sponsored him. Anna never liked Carr. She'd never liked him. The reason she didn't like him is Carr and Overbury, when he'd been alive, had made no attempt to treat her with respect. In fact, they publicly laughed at her. She was um, being frozen out of her husband's affection uh, by this guy. Anna sponsor took her some, uh, some persuasion, but she eventually joined a faction that sponsored this handsome, elegant new young man. And James took the bait. He was, he'd learned nothing from Carr. Although no, he'd learned one thing. Buckingham was actually fairly intelligent and sweet-natured. Now, I should point out the image on the uh, other side there is James's daughter, Elizabeth, grown up a little bit, because these people really formed the backdrop to the last big drama of James's life. James was losing no time in promoting George Villiers all the way up to the dukedom of Buckingham, um, because James, by this time, was getting old. Prematurely old, but the, the, he liked to drink um, and it was starting to take its toll. His teeth were falling out. His uh, weight was actually shooting up. There are reports of him being too fat to happily mount a horse. Or, <laughs> I'm guessing it's the horse that wasn't too happy about it. But um, Buckingham was embraced into the family fold. And this is where we start to see, I mentioned family right at the start of this talk. We really see it with Buckingham. When Anna died, she was only 44, but she'd, um, she had long-term health problems, I think osteoarthritis and things, although it was always called the gout in the um, 16th century. They also had a terrible, terrible doctor, uh, Dr Myern, who would prescribe things like go out and chop wood in February if you're dying of rheumatoid arthritis, or um, <laughs> split a live chicken up the spine and put it on your head if you are dying of pneumonia. Um, these things did not work, and they killed Prince J. Uh, sorry, Prince Henry, James's son, and they probably helped finish off Anna as well. After Anna's death, we start seeing James's letters sort of shift in their tone to Buckingham. Buckingham becomes my sweet child and wife. Um, he fell back into this familial imagery, and what he really wanted was a kind of big loving family. Buckingham, he let marry uh, Susan Manners, and uh, she reported it wasn't a love match, so James was okay with him marrying. She was a, a very rich heiress. And James started doting on their children. He became very, very much a family man again. The family man he'd probably never really been with his own children. He started calling Charles, Prince Charles, baby Charles. Um, what we find, though, is that family, funnily enough, was the cause of his last great crisis and kind of his, his last illness as well. His daughter, Elizabeth, had married the Elector Palatine. James's idea was that she should make a Protestant match and Charles would make a Catholic match. James was all about balance. That's what he wanted to achieve in Europe. Unfortunately, this did not work because Elizabeth's husband... Um, Frederick, Elector Palatine, was offered the crown of Bohemia, which was Habsburg property. He accepted it. He, he wrote to James saying, should I accept this? And James wrote back saying no. But before his no got there, Frederick had accepted it. And this kicked off the Thirty Years' War, which was one of the bloodiest conflicts in Europe. At the same time, James was trying to get his son Charles say, to marry the Spanish Infanta. That was going to be his uh, Catholic match. Buckingham and Charles went to Spain stupidly and undid a lot of diplomatic work. 
and failed to secure the Spanish match and came back and decided we hate Catholics and we hate Spain now and tried to stir up the English Parliament in its war frenzy. James had kept England out of war for his entire reign in England and it was all starting to unravel towards the end. And it was quite a sad end because Buckingham had been his lover. He'd really, really loved the guy. And Buckingham had abandoned him and basically made best friends with Charles because he saw that James was obviously not going to last forever and Charles was the rising sun. So James died essentially cut off in a way emotionally, at least from both his son and his lover. And there, I know there are rumours and I know they are making a TV show about this, that Buckingham and Charles supposedly got together and poisoned him to shut him up, finally to shut up this um, old man that was obsessed with peace. Did they do it? No, they absolutely didn't. James probably had a series of strokes at the end, lost the power of speech um, and died. Buckingham and Charles would get their war, they would manage to stoke up war fever in the wake of James's death and they would end up making an absolute mess of it and um, causing a lot of unnecessary bloodshed. But of course that is another story. James died peacefully in his bed. And I, the final thing I really wanted to say, because that's obviously point 10, was his death. What I've read in every biography, what you do when you're writing a biography actually is, you try and read every biography that you can find of that subject. And you start to think, okay, what is the common thread here? What is everyone saying about this person that I'm going to write about? And then you go and read the primary sources and you think, is that agreeing with what they've all said about him? Am I meeting the person in the primary sources that I've read about in all these biographies and secondary sources? The person I read about in the biographies was quite different. People had different takes on James, but there was one common thread. Almost everyone said this about James. He was uncharismatic. Compared to the Tudors, particularly compared to Henry VIII, compared to Elizabeth I, James was supposedly very uncharismatic, very unkingly. That's not what I met in the primary sources. In the primary sources, what I met was a James who held power for a long time. Unlike Henry VIII and Elizabeth and all the Tudors, there were no major uprisings during his time in England. He held things together well. He managed to keep England peaceful for longer than Elizabeth did. So I actually found a, a very charismatic man. He liked to make jokes. He um, certainly liked to build friendships, build networks. So uh, it was interesting to me that I was finding a different King James from the one I'd expected to find. Started out thinking, oh, he's awful, uncharismatic. Um, found out that when I finished writing it, actually kind of missed him when I wrote the, the last sentence of the book. I kind of missed him. Although I, I still won't forgive him for the witches. But sorry, that's uh, me going a little bit over, sorry. But um, if we have time for questions, I'll be happy to take them. <laughs> Thank you. Stephen, that was a, a stunning talk. Uh, fantastic to get history made so interesting but also fun at the same time as well. So thank Thanks. You. We, we do have uh, five minutes or so if anybody has a question for Stephen. Both. Hi, good, good. thanks for the talk, it was very interesting. One thing that struck me though, somebody said to me what was James the first big achievement, I would immediately go to the Bible. The Bible, yes, it, it 16. Didn't mention I considered putting in as one of the top 10. The reason I didn't include that was because it wasn't, well, it was him, and he actually had a, a fairly important role. Yes, in commissioning it from 1604 when he commissioned the Bible, then 1611 when it was published. But one of the things I didn't want to do is give him. <laughs> give him credit for it when it was obviously the commissions and the teams that he put together that did the translation, that did the, the hard work of it. And it's, I have to say, it's usually the one thing that people know about King James, just the sort of general public. When you ask King James, they'll say the King James Bible. So I wanted to stay away from that thing that everybody already knows. Any other questions? I've got a couple. We'll go there first. Hi, thanks, that was really fascinating, especially in the 
how far we went into, you know, or the started pursuing that side of things as well. Yes, uh, so James, yeah, James was key. James, uh, of course, everyone knows about Jamestown. Jamestown. This is another example of, he was key in commissioning it and granting charters and encouraging it, but of course, uh, he doesn't seem to have shown an actual interest himself, although his court did. So we have Pocahontas, for example, um, coming in 1617 and uh, visiting the court, watching plays and things like that. There was, I think there was an interest, but... Um, James's overriding interests, I think, were in trying to carve out a, a role in Europe, and it was to try and make himself Europe's great big peacemaker. Uh, he really liked the idea of him and, I guess, Britain, as he would have thought of it, holding the balance of power in Europe. If America could have helped that, I'm sure he would have been even more interested. We know that James was... Uh keen to be King of England as well as Scotland from a very early age. We know that Cecil was determined that he would succeed. When do you think Elizabeth came to the conclusion that he was going to be her successor? That's a, a very good question. So James entered into discussions, secret discussions with Cecil after Essex died. The Earl of Essex had been James's big contact at the English court, but um, Essex was a rash um, hothead and obviously tried to mount a rebellion, failed, got his head chopped off and Cecil very quickly stepped into the breach and began sort of working. Now there is a story that Cecil got a letter from James and I believe it was at Greenwich and he was walking in the gardens with Queen Elizabeth I and the post rider came up and went to hand him a packet of letters, including James's secret correspondence, and Elizabeth intervened and took it. And Cecil, I can imagine Cecil, uh, panicked a little bit because his secrets were going to be revealed, and he supposedly begged Queen Elizabeth, please don't open this uh, packet of letters. Why? Because it will. Uh, there are other, the rest of the court is watching. Your faith in me will be questioned if you open diplomatic letters in front of everyone. That's my job. And she supposedly just said, OK, and, and handed it back. Now, if true, it's an apocryphal story, but I think it goes to a, a sort of true place. I think she knew. I think she knew for a long time. I think she knew when Mary Queen of Scots was deposed, probably, that James was going to be her successor. But James did something that annoys me. Um, <laughs> several things, but one thing in particular was he really played to the idea that Elizabeth held all the cards and that he needed Elizabeth to say in writing, you are my successor. She never did that and it never mattered. It ended up, it was all the, the politicians did all the, the sort of background work. So it turned out Elizabeth didn't hold all the cards. Um, she'd when she became Queen of England in 1558, the Spanish ambassador, I think it was the Spanish ambassador, said to her, you owe your thanks to your late sister Mary, Mary I of England. And Elizabeth supposedly quipped, no, I don't. It was God's work, uh, God and Parliament that had put her in place. She didn't need to be nominated by her sister. What did she start saying as soon as the question of her own succession came up? I get to nominate, it's, it's up to me. And suddenly God and Parliament aren't important anymore. Um, so I think Elizabeth knew for a long time, really, that, that it was coming, but she was almost pathologically terrified of naming James, of stating it was James, um, from her perspective, because it would give reason to, to kill her. It, would, it might be people that just want to put an end to her reign, they know who's coming, get rid of her, and James can come immediately. Stephen, thank you so much. I need to bring this evening's wonderful event to a close. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the event half as much as I have learned so much and been smiling at the back at the same time, which is very rare for me, as my colleagues will tell you. Um, just to say a few thank yous. Thank you to Claire for the introduction. Thank you to Edinburgh College for their input into live streaming tonight's event. I hope everybody at home has enjoyed it. Uh, everybody, you will receive... Uh, a form to give us some feedback. We'd be delighted if you would give us some feedback on what you hopefully enjoyed about tonight, but what you'd like to see in the future. And with the future in mind, we've got some great events coming up for the next couple of months next year, so have a look 
on our website to say, I'd love to see you back here. Just a little bit of retail with Christmas round the corner. Sorry to mention that word on 30th of November, but it is 1st December tomorrow. The Wisest Fool is available outside, and thanks to the publisher, Berlin, not £25, but £20. And Stephen will be joining me outside just at the shop if you want to get a signed copy. Thank you all very much indeed for coming out in such huge numbers on such a chilly evening. Please, I've heard the gritters going past, so please take care on your way home. Stay cosy until we see you again. And please join me in thanking Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Sorry about that. Collecting it, I don't know. No, it's not. It's, it's not.